Do this one thing in the morning, first thing in the morning, to burn stubborn body fat. Hold on a second. There is no secret thing you can do. However, there is something you can do that'll probably affect your behaviors later on in the day that will benefit you if you're trying to burn body fat. What is it? Eat a high protein breakfast. This has been shown to regulate insulin levels throughout the day, regardless of what you eat, and this will affect your cravings. Insulin spikes and drops tends to make people crave things that are hyper palatable. In other words, if you eat a high protein breakfast, you're less likely to overeat later on throughout the day. So it is something that can help you burn body fat. I thought you were going to let us guess. I was going to be like, cinnamon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. something weird. Yeah. I yeah. actually, I really, I really like that tip. Um, Aside from that, it's a bit controversial for burning body fat, right? People are going to yes. be like that. Uh, That's why I was going like to make said, an argument, whatever. Uh -huh. Bring on the internet. Um, mainly because, and we've talked about this ad nauseum on the on the podcast, is most all the clients I ever train um, under eight protein. Yep. And one of the first things that we focus on, whether you wanted to lose ten pounds or a hundred pounds of body fat, uh, is building muscle and speeding the metabolism up first. And you can have the best programming in the world, but if you don't give the body the proper nutrients, i.e. protein, in order to do that, you're just not going to do that. And one of the major things that kept my clients from consistently hitting protein is getting behind early on in the day. It would be the client who had, because they would do things like, oh, I had, you know, two eggs and toast yeah, and avocado. Yeah, yeah, so I had 12, protein. 12 grams. Yeah, you, you <laughs> had, you know, 10 to 12 grams of protein. That's what's what's hurting us. And then by noon, you're trying to play catch up and then you never get there. And so just simply getting my clients to eat a high protein meal, aside from the benefits that you touched on, also would put them uh, on target to hit their protein intake, which is is paramount to building uh, muscle, yes. building a metabolism, which in turn will help you shred totally. body fat. Well said. No, so there's three main reasons why this is important. Uh, you touched on one, a high protein diet, you build more muscle. That's great if you want to burn body fat because you have a higher metabolic rate. The second one is, and they've done studies like this where they control the calories, right? Everybody's eating the same calories, but this group over here eats a high protein diet and this group over here doesn't. The high protein group, even though the calories are controlled, loses more body fat as well. So it actually helps with pure fat loss, and it's probably due to the muscle preserving effects. Whereas this group over here loses 10 pounds, more of it comes from muscle than this group over here because they have high protein. And then the last reason is the one that I'm, I'm, I'm touching on or I talked about early on, and CGM studies show mm -hmm. this, right, is if you eat a high protein breakfast, your insulin spikes and drops are blunted in comparison to if you didn't eat a high protein breakfast throughout the day. Now, why mm -hmm. is that important? Well, those spikes in insulin and the drops in insulin drive behavior. So if you find it difficult, cravings. yes, if you find it difficult throughout the day uh, when it comes to cravings, one of the best things you do is simply eat a high protein breakfast. Now, now let's take a step back real quick and let's examine what the modern world has told us a good breakfast is for decades now. <laughs> It is not a high protein breakfast. Almost every traditional breakfast food, if you look in the context of what they recommend, there might be some eggs, but it's two or mm. one. Yeah. There might be some bacon, but it's a three strip, you know, a few strips. Most of it is pastries, yeah. cereals, pancakes, grains. Readily available everywhere. It's so hard to just be like, oh, I'm gonna go down the street and get a bunch of protein. That's right. Impossible. No. So you're 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 starting your day off with a high carbohydrate meal, which is also simultaneously low in protein, which also has been shown to improve or increase, I should say, the ups and downs throughout the day, regardless of what you eat. This is the interesting thing here. Regardless of what you eat, if the breakfast was high protein, those insulin spikes and drops are going to be more controlled, regardless. So it's really, now there is no, and I opened this with a little bit of a, of a hook, right? Like this one thing you could do to burn body fat, because I know that's what you know, the internet likes to do to capture people's attention. There is no secret thing that you can do, but this gets as close to that as you could possibly get because it affects so many different things. So literally, if you changed your breakfast from what you normally eat, which is probably carbohydrate heavy, heavy and simply made it protein heavy or majority protein, um, then the long ranging effects throughout the day with muscle, with fat loss, they're significant. So this one thing right here is one thing that probably will affect your fat loss uh, attempts in a positive way. I like sure. when you do tips like that. I like 
controversial hook, sure. grab everyone's attention, and then we get an opportunity to explain. Because obviously there's going to be the 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 knee jerk reaction of if you it's all about calories, and if you just reduce calories, and it doesn't matter if they still eat the same amount of calories. It's like, but part of what makes a trainer really good is finding these little tips and hacks that are very simple for the average person to adhere to, but makes big differences in their pursuit of whatever their, their fitness in goal particular, is. In particular in their behaviors. Yes. Yeah. And th this one tip that you're saying, it, it has a massive difference with their behaviors mm -hmm. throughout the day, how they feel, the foods that they're going to crave, do they consistently hit their protein take? All those things are, are areas that I was always challenged with, with clients. And if I could give them one single tip of just saying, hey, all I want you to do is go get 40 grams for breakfast of yeah. protein, and we don't need to get in the nuance of the science mm -hmm. and everything that's happening inside the body and why that's so important. Just, just go do that. Go do that. And what I know well, naturally happening is less cravings, more mm -hmm. consistently hit the protein intake, like satiety, satiety producing. So like you're going to get all these other, these other benefits I know that come with it, which in turn helps change behaviors, which is the main thing it's, that we're always trying to help. It's just interesting to me because, and I don't think there's this nefarious group that's like, we're going to make Americans or the, you know, we're going to make modern world fat. Well, know? I'll bring up a nefarious group when you're done. Okay, <laughs> good. I, I, I'm like, I'm waiting for Justin because he's always got yeah, the Yeah, I, I got some information. But I, but I don't think there was a group of people that sat down and said, how can we make everybody unhealthy? Let's, let's, let's really sell the idea that breakfast is supposed to be a bunch of carbohydrates and sugar and low in protein. I don't think that's the case. I think what happened was food producers tried to make foods that have a high shelf life that they could also mass produce and sell for cheap. Well, carbohydrates are easy to do that with. You could sell flour, you could sell pancake ingredients, or take it a step further, cereal. You put the box in the <coughs> cupboard, super easy for mom or dad to give the kids breakfast and themselves because they only got five minutes before school. Throw it in a bowl, here you go, and you could sell a ton of it versus steak, yeah. eggs, you got to prepare. Uh, what else would you do, right? So- it just it just so happens that the recommendation that they made, which was convenient, also palatable, happened to also be the exact opposite of what would contribute to uh, to positive health. So, all right, what's who's nefarious? Well, so <laughs> in, in terms of getting your protein source, like don't listen to the WEF. Oh, uh, you, you know how they're trying to get us on bugs. Well, World Wrestling Federation, Who? Yeah, no, no, the no. World Economic <laughs> Forum. Uh, <laughs> yeah, close. They're also <laughs> actors. <laughs> yeah, very much an actor. Yeah. Very much trying to portray yeah certain things. They got a lot of heels. They, yeah. yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> Uh, apparently the uh, chitin, I guess is how you say this. This is like part of the exosomes of like some of these like bugs that they're trying to promote as like a good protein source mm. actually cause like this inflammatory cytokine response. And so it's what? been nice. very, yeah, very uh, uh, much not to your best interest. So through a wrench in the whole the whole bug plan, huh? Bugs, yeah. We we don't is that we don't do well just just off of bugs alone. I'm sure like it's supplemental. Like you're surviving, right? You've seen all these survival shows. Yeah, where you eat bugs of course. for protein. Yeah, sure, but. Uh, apparently your gut doesn't respond very well. Is this relatively new information? Like, is that, cause it is, it, it does feel like we've toned down the, uh, you know, we should eat. Yeah. Bugs. I don't know. I saw, I saw this information, I read it. And then I saw a video of this guy kind of doing a lecture on it. And I think it was just like kind of conveniently pushed aside amongst, you know, a lot of the push for, for getting us to eat bugs. You know, we have to consider always that the, that the, these are all markets, right? And so markets do what markets do best, which is they try to meet consumer demand, also try to find how to create a profit. So you ask, why bugs? Is it to save the climate? No, no it's, cheap. it's, it's, it's cheap yeah. and bug foods are going to be highly processed. I, I don't think, I don't know anybody <laughs> who is going to order bugs and they're going to come in a bag and then they're going to barbecue them like they would with the steak. <laughs> What's going to happen? They're yeah, going to come in crackers. Powder. They're going to come in powders. They're yeah. going to come in all kinds of different, you know, processed foods. And, and those types of foods have high margins. You also can protect them with patents because you have your, your cricket, you know, cookies yeah. or chips or whatever. Yeah. Whereas buying a steak is a steak. Thorax, you're not, triscuits. You're not, yeah, you're not, you're not patenting yeah. a, a, an egg or a chicken or a chicken or a steak. Nonetheless, even those foods have gone through metamorphosis because of the markets. In fact, I have a picture here. Doug, maybe you could pull up oh, um, chickens over the last 
60 oh, years. They have look, you seen these? Yes, they look crazy. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right. Back to the show. Dude, okay. You know, uh, you know, like an original chicken looks like a little tiny bird, bro. It looks oh, like a little, and wow. then now they're oh, look, wow. they look like fucking big old fat yeah, and Godzilla listen, birds. Listen now. to this. Yeah, and now this is the, I've seen the picture comparison oh, before. Now this is simultaneously the, the huge breast, the now. beauty and mm -hmm. power of the of the market and consumers, but also a little word of warning, right? Because what we want, we'll get, even though we don't need it necessarily. But over the last sixty years, chickens have grown. 364%. <laughs> Maps anabolic. We've created. Yeah, yeah. 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 We've Chicken created. Where, where do we sign up to inject that? Listen to this. In 1940s, in the 1940s, Chicken was expensive. There, look at late 1957 to 2005. Look at wow. that. Yeah, it kind of looks like Americans. Now put an American 1957 to 2005. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We look the same. We follow the same path. I, yeah, I bet they do look so real similar. Check this out. In, 19, in the 1940s, chicken was, the average chicken was co cost $3. Adjusted for inflation, that's $30 today. Wow. So it was also expensive back in the day. You but know, yeah. I was thinking like the the Rocky movie would need to adjust. Do you remember when he's trying to chase the chickens? I bet it's a lot easier now. <laughs> this yeah, is a very fat, lazy chickens. Right. Yeah. Check this out. Not only are they that much bigger, but they grow two and a half times as fast. So they also they grow and and they produce bigger egg bigger eggs grow faster way more so the chick I mean have you ever seen like now like you ever bought one of those packages before where the chicken breasts are like this dude yeah. they're like they weigh like a <laughs> pound for like one chicken <laughs> breast like where they get those yeah those crazy uh, also their omega six to omega three ratio of modern chickens can be high as twenty to one. That's three times that of pasture raised chicken. So if you get chickens that eat like bugs and stuff that the WF wants us to eat, yeah. if you get those kind of chickens, it's a far better ratio of omega sixes to omega threes. Whereas conventional chickens are fed corn and grain and, and all that other stuff. So how Crazy. do you so how do you personally like reconcile this? Because you also understand the because of this, our ability to feed millions of more people and yeah. help more people right like yeah. we'll never like th there was a time where like you could starve like you could literally starve where we've moved out science you know, has moved us away from what that. a great question because people always make that argument it's we don't have a food production problem counter to what a, pop a lot of people believe we have a distribution problem and has that always been true has it always been just distribution no. or is it production before no, and it was and we went crazy with it right we went so crazy with it that we created lots of other problems and in america to 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 die of starvation it's in comparison to obesity is like it's so rare you're far more likely to oh, die God, of too much yeah, here yeah, to obesity. it's not even fair but it's a distribution issue it's a markets issue um it's not that we don't necessarily that we don't produce enough i mean if if, if all the food that we produced was distributed properly in just America alone. Uh, it would be uh, we, we, it would be significant. So it really has more to do with how the markets operate and distribution. And there's a lot of countries where distribution is hard because their local governments and their governments are just they make it almost impossible. Like we'll give aid to other countries, yeah. and it ends up going to the hoard it goes to the wealthy people yeah. of those countries, and then they, they control it to the. Not only that, but I it was it. Was it uh, Arthur Brooks's documentary that covered this, uh, or, or or somewhere else? Was it we, the pursuit? Yeah, was it his, or was it where? Where was that covered? Where you, I because I was unfamiliar with this of how much uh, aid actually hurts a lot of countries yeah. when you go and you provide all this free stuff. You also kill the the local jobs that produce that by doing that, and there we was don't one realize Justin, how uh, a Wren he was talking about that. He talked on, about that on quite a level. Yeah, when they're yeah. trying to get in with the wells. It's and fascinating that. because you don't. It, a lot of people don't think of that. You well, and yeah. you assume because you're donating, you're giving, it's free. And well, it's here's like, why. That's so frustrating. Here's why because people listening are like, "What are you talking about?" Uh, you go into a country. Um, and they're struggling, but they have rice farmers, let's say, yeah. but they're still struggling. So they then have we an say, economy hey. established. So we say, hey, we're going to go in there and just give everybody free rice. What you've done is, yes, you fed a lot of people, but you've now destroyed their local rice market. Right. And then you wait one or two generations, they don't have anybody that can produce and right. grow rice anymore. Now they're dependent 
on on the rice coming from other countries. They're dependent on us. Just like if someone came in here and gave everybody here free food, our markets would crash. And then eventually within a couple generations, three generations, two generations, we wouldn't have the means to even produce. And so then we'd be like, well, why would we? We're getting all this free free stuff. So, is the, so is you have the, to think three steps ahead. Basically. Yeah. So is is so it, when it comes to charitable things like that, is is it a better strategy like uh, to support efficiency? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Than it is to actually replace or give. Like I've even heard the things like um, you know Toms are famous for they, they, that brand blew up because they used to like give away a pair of shoes to a, uh -huh. a place like you know, maybe if you have a local shoemaker or a local person that does the leather and soles and stuff like that, it's like you literally potentially. Uh, you know, cripple those people that are building those jobs, and that maybe that Doug can look this up because I looked this up the other day. I actually literally had this big conversation with my wife the other yeah. day because we were looking, uh, we're, we're really trying to find charities that we could donate to and help, and we had found one. And then I'm like, you know what? Let me look into it. And their financial records were hidden, and so I said, okay, are there ranking systems? Are there companies third party? There is. There is. I've heard of this. So mm -hmm. if you look up Doug. Um, uh, charity rankings or third party charity uh, regulations or something like that. You'll see all these third party companies that will rank yeah, they give charity their fina financials too, right? Like in terms of yes. how they structure, payouts. efficiency, yeah. how much they pay their the people that run the right. place versus how much goes to the actual people. I think that's beautiful because that uh, I cool. would hate Be transparency with that. Boy, yeah. nothing would make me more mad than donating. You know, you see a, you know, like those companies that send you a picture of a kid, like, oh, I'm going to help that kid. And then you end up finding out. You know, you send them 30 bucks, the kid gets 25 cents, the rest goes to, but I, I did find one good organization, no affiliation with us, World Vision. I looked at, they, they do really, really well. And you basically pay for a kid and then they, you put them through school and stuff like that. Now, what is your opinion too, on the, since you are going down this rabbit hole of like looking into all this stuff like that? Um, because I've also heard the argument of like uh, working inside out, right? Yeah. Where you can see your money at work, like there's probably uh, quite a few people within your own circle, of course. whether that be your church community, your family, mm -hmm. or hundred percent close friends that Dude, are in I'm need. I always subscribe to that. Yeah, you did that the other day, Adam. I hope you don't mind me putting you on, but I don't. Want, I won't say too much. I don't know how much you want people to know, but I know you supported somebody's uh, education that you know personally. I think that's a, a what better way than to help people you know around you where you can see the what's happening and you know and you trust and then you know why not why and, and more of your money goes to them than to bureaucrats that's kind of how i've always felt because yeah. i uh, i mean that, that's why i subscribe to that way i guess yeah. of doing charity cuz I, I am a little more skeptical and uh, of yeah. organizations that are putting it especially when like there's a lot of like there's a lot of hustles in like nonprofits and things like that yeah. and i didn't know a lot of that till later on it's like man a lot of these corporations you know uh and today i feel like it's become even more popular that brands sometimes even before they come up with like their idea of what the, how they're gonna make money they're like okay yeah. this is gonna be we're gonna we're gonna give to this or this is gonna be our our like how we present just so they can get people get people bought in yep. onto whatever they're doing and then they just figure out a thing to sell and really it's just a clever way to get themselves paid mm -hmm. and, and and I'm not saying that's everybody by the way because I know there's people going to get the knee jerk reaction of like oh my god that's not I'm not saying everybody is like that but there are a lot of companies I that agree do shit you. like no, that no I agree with you I think the best thing you could do is help the people around you that you know that need help and that will benefit from it that aren't going to squander it take advantage of you lie because you can see them you know them i think that's the that's probably the, imagine if everybody do that yeah how, uh, how i mean i even think about that when we i mean again this is giving a little more behind the scenes personal information about us and and i think how we steer this company is i even think about that within this business like a lot of the times when we decide we're going to do something we're in the middle of this right now building another leg to the business and the thought process for me is like can we build another department that generates enough revenue that actually creates five to six jobs yeah. for other people. It's not like, oh, this is going to line my pockets more. We've all put ourselves in a position where it's just like, okay, we feel good about where we're at. Now, when an idea for the business to generate more revenue, the totally. thought is, can we build a department that at least sustains itself, doesn't bleed, doesn't bleed the original business that we built and can we actually create another revenue stream that also creates three to five to ten more jobs yeah. like that's 
Dude. To me, I think that's like my my way. I feel I can help the best with utilizing my skill sets. I think that's and, great. I, you know, it's funny too. You talk about um, you know giving money and not knowing where it goes. Like the laundering that goes on with like um, like government aid or foreign aid, I should say. I watched the clip that you sent, Justin, where they were talking about yeah. like the money we're sending overseas to some countries. And there were politicians, I'm not going to get too much details, you can look it up yourself, but they were talking about sending X amount of billions of dollars to this other country. And the politician gets up there and literally says, he says this to Congress, it's a clip, and he goes, don't worry, the money's all going to go back to our defense contractors. Huh? Yeah. So in other words, we're sending them X amount of billions of dollars. We're laundering. Because then it. that money's going back to U.S. defense contractors. It's like a wonderful way of paying the people that pay for your campaign and your whatever. Yeah, Crazy. To, re to rebuild. Uh, yeah, and then yeah, to rebuild. The, the, from the war. That's yeah, they're sad. already anticipating that. It's so frustrating to, to see that. Oh, so frustrating. Yeah, That's I don't sad. know. I think, too, like, a, I don't know. Uh, we, in terms of charity, like, I love to think about other ways besides money to really, like, get involved with things sure. and, like, you know, be in the community and help and, like, you know, tangibly do something, like, you know, whether it's, like, through your skill set, your education, or, like, being able to kind of move things and, you know, be physically present. Um, I think that's a lost thing. I, I It's not promoted very often in, in social media, especially. No, no. All right, I got, I got a study for you guys. Another one came out on a GLP-1 semaglutide, and then I have something that ties to it. But I'll read you the study, because there's more and more studies now coming out on, on GLP-1s. And, and so this was a huge study, one of the largest studies on the effects of uh, semaglutide. It reduces the risk of death from all causes by almost 20%. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All causes. What? By almost 20%. Now that's because- Because it's reducing obesity, that's why. Part of it. I think that's a big part of it. Right. It's got to be. The other part of it is improves insulin sensitivity, but that's the biggest part. Because right Yeah, because I, 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 you could probably line that up right next to another study that shows people that lose X amount of weight of their body Correct. weight probably see all that also. You're right. right? And, and now check this out. So this is what they showed in the study too. A 23% drop in COVID-19 related deaths, but we knew how much obesity played a role in that. But 20%- there is no, I don't, I can't think of a single uh, drug that would do that, except for maybe in extreme cases where it's like you're you're gonna die anyway, so let's take this and now it'll reduce all costs. Yeah, this is just people who are overweight, twenty percent reduction, which is I'm wild. so interested. And by the way, I hmm. want to I want to make a conscious effort for us to share with the audience as we go through this journey with these these fifty people. So I want to make sure that every week when we have our check ins yeah. and our meetings that we share with the audience like what we're seeing because a lot of this is a very uh, is a learning experience for all of us. Like you, rec we recognize the the shift it's going to make on culture and and where it's going. We recognize the pros, the cons, the challenges, and then now it's like okay, now we have this intimate group of you know fifty different body types and goals, and we definitely are learning that right. We have lo a very wide range yep. of people that are using these GLP ones mm -hmm. uh, and different challenges, and so I'm really really interested in what the outcome of, of this group looks like and then how um how accurate that is of, of a example a representation yeah representation yeah. of what we're going to see in in, in society because i don't know this is going to be this can be interesting I, th you know what sucks so i've I, like i go back and forth with my thought so, around this so do i because I, I think <laughs> about this a lot I, i've never seen anything this potentially impactful ever um it, one thing that's this impactful so I go back and forth. I have a fear, which is, oh, great. They're going to just put this in the water. Like, they're just going to give this to everybody <laughs> because obesity is such fluoride, a problem. So, yeah. And so like, I don't know if I like that. And then I have this other side to me, which is like, obesity is so bad. It's so out of control. Our health is so out of control right now that will that give us more good than bad? I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't. I've never felt like that about a, a pharmaceutical where I'm like, yeah, gonna, give it to everybody. Is right? there anything like that though? Have you guys have ever thought about like what else is like that where we are so bad in one direction that the resolution wasn't ideal, but it, it better made, than what we have. Yeah, yeah, but better than what we had. Yeah, is there an example sense. of that, that that comes to mind? Because I'm with you on Sal. I've I hmm. wrestle with this all the time. It's uh, almost like a. Uh, are we? Is it one of those? unfortunate realities like but are you, we just going there because that's it There's but you know i want I would, here's a great example here's a great opportunity for us to share what we learned in the group without sharing personal names there was a lady who uh who brought up that the glp1 
has uh, completely like eliminated these these uh, this binge craving feeling, but yet she still recognized that she went. You know, the one that, w- that oh, still went for the ice because she was stress related. Yes, yeah. and so this is to me like imagine that person with also the crazy right. cravings. Like it still was difficult for her. To, uh, to definitely lessen the blow, right? Though. To yeah. resist the urge to still go get ice cream, and and, and what the GLP one did was at least blunt took the, the craving. Yeah, away. she had no craving, no hunger signal to do it, but yet she still made. And I love that she was open enough to share this with us so we can work through and we're this with see her. This. Right, yes. exactly. That and then yet it gave her enough of 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 her like it was a pause. Yeah, because like, she didn't have the craving, well, and she's like, but I still want it because I'm stressed, and I still did it. Yeah. Right. And right. so what's going on here where imagine that same person with all those crazy natural urges. Super hard to stop. Super hard. And to super see past that because you're so connected. You, have, you know what it is? And I, I like to talk to fitness professionals like this because I know I know the mindset that a fitness fanatic can get in, which is, and, and I know this is you if you're listening, so don't deny it. I know that sometimes you look around and go, just stop, just do the right thing. What's wrong with you guys? Look at your health. <laughs> yeah. Like, People are suffering from terrible health due to largely, not all, because there's other stuff too, but largely due to overconsumption mm-hmm. and inactivity. Okay, largely. And so people are not dumb. People aren't walking around oblivious right. to their right. poor health. It's just way harder to stop and change than you think. You got right. the whole world against you. The whole world tells you to live and eat this way. Don't follow that advice, by the way. It's terrible, but yet that's what you hear. You grow up in it. That's what you do. Your behaviors are cycled and built around it. And then right around a certain age, you're like, I got to fix this. Yeah. Oh, that's hard, man. You are you are literally trying to change a fundamental part of who you are, which anybody who's ever done that knows that is not easy to do permanently, especially when the whole world says, who cares? Go this way. It's yeah. fine. You're, you know, eat this, eat that. Don't move. So it is hard. So And I- has drug-like properties that give you this feedback of this feels good this tastes good this is good it's so i mean imagine that too you're not only trying more, to find me a drug that kills more people yeah. than, than than the over than than food yeah in the modern society it doesn't come close well you you were trying to speculate as like a comparison of something yeah, that was, yeah. like i and, and this isn't the best comparison but i was thinking about like you know kind of what we know with like ssris or like uh you know with um in terms of depression, like, a, you know, an anxiety and depression yeah. and medication, it's like, you know, some people have like crippling anxiety, but like you can make an argument now, like they're probably not the best, you know, in terms sure. of like long term, but like in something where you feel like numb or neutral, you know, that mm-hmm. that was sort of the compromise with it. But, you know, I don't there's know. There's nothing in this category. There's nothing like no. else I can really I think. Can't, by the way, I'll say this to the pharmaceutical industry. They need a win. If this indeed is a win, which I think, if done properly, it will be a win. They need a win, especially after uh, some of the debacles that they've gone through uh, and their big misses. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, I got some stats for you guys just to show you. Like, we're not in a good place. Like, we're not in a good place. A lot of it is due to obesity, but not all of it. Like, like check this out. In the last 30 years, okay, we, we were all kids 30 years ago. So it's not like, you know, before we were here, 30 years, over the last 30 years, ADHD went up 819%. Alzheimer's, 300%. Autism, 2,000%. Bipolar disease in youth, 10,000%. Celiac disease, 1,000%. Chronic fatigue syndrome, 11,000%. Depression, almost 300%. Diabetes, 300%. Fibromyalgia, 7,000%. Hypothyroidism, 700%. Lupus, 780%. Osteoarthritis, 450%. And sleep apnea, 430%. That is not due to more awareness. Because I know people are, oh, we're more aware. No, we're not more aware to the tune of 10,000% more. We are doing something to ourselves. Part of it is obesity. There's other stuff that's going on. At what point do you chalk up nefarious things in terms of the environment? I think, I don't know if it's nefarious or it's more like, the way that we regulate and check on things is here's a new chemical I'd like to introduce into the market. Cool. Test that chemical. 
But shouldn't we test it in combination with all these 10,000 other new right. chemicals? Or what, I guess my point is with that is like, you know, you go through the process of creating these drugs or creating, yeah. you know, these foods and, and you know, like in house within the organization, you get the research back, but you keep pressing it because of your uh, demands for, uh, you know, the shareholders yeah. and, and, you know, you keep pushing pushing it out to the public and, and to the point where we're all just suffering the consequences. of it. I tell you what, the more I more and more believe in this. I've said this before, but your best bet, I hate to say this for health, mental, spiritual, physical health is to not live like everybody else. That's it. Yeah. If you're weird, be, be an anomaly. If okay, you're weird. Yeah. Okay. You speaking of that, that's a perfect transition for something I wanted to ask you today is the, the trad wife, uh, oh God! Like this whole uh, trend. social media—that's still a thing. It was like it's, it's exploding. It's, it's exploding, and it's okay. and it's getting bigger and bigger, and it's uh, causing all kinds of yeah. controversy and debate and arguments on both sides. Uh, I had a friend, so my Hampton group. Uh, some of them listen, so shout out to them who who listen. Uh, JT was the one that sent this over, uh, sent it over, and said, "I mean, I'd love to hear your guys' opinion." And I saw it was a. Trevor Noah uh, podcast, which right away I like had reservation because I'm not the biggest fan of him. And I'm like, you know what? That's not a reason for me to to, to not listen to this. In Good fact, I, I should listen to it yeah. because I probably don't agree with this guy. And so um, I told him, I said, okay, I'm going to listen to it because you sent it over. And then, I, then I'm going to send it over to my partner and see what, see what he thinks. And so I sent it to you and Jessica. I think you guys watched mm -hmm. it, right? And, um, you know, it's really interesting... Uh, the the first of all the movement and then uh to listen to these two girls on his show like trying to 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 counter it as like it's such the, this awful thing now why i wasn't the biggest fan of that conversation in particular is and and this is the problem with all of social media in my opinion is almost every topic you can possibly think of there's a spectrum of people that are 100% agree and the extreme version of it on both sides. And then like 90% of the people are somewhere in the middle of the spectrum. But all the arguments and debates have to do with the the outer. If, if that makes sense how what I'm explaining? I, I, like I do, but I, I see, I look at it differently with what okay, I'm saying me, right now. I, I, I don't think it's extreme versus extreme in the other direction. I think it's more, there's the reality and then there's the social media marketing version of that reality that tries to sell it. So like you have the trad wife. So trad stands for traditional. Okay. Right. So whatever your traditional uh, wife values, but here's what happens on social media. They depict a woman and this is because they're looking for views and stuff like that. Yeah, so they, they like make a she, costume. Out she's of it. dressed like a 1962 commercial yeah. wearing the perfect dress and makeup and she's in heels and she's making from scratch yeah. It's her like kids wife Cheeto whatever. snacks, which yeah. takes, you know, eight hours. And she's got four <laughs> kids that she takes care of. And yet they don't watch TV and she's never tired and everything's great. And no, that's not reality. Okay. I, I had a traditional mom. My grandmother's traditional. I know what it's like to live a traditional life with lots of kids. You ain't walking around in heels and whatever. Your kids are helping because they're helping <laughs> yeah, yeah. to raise the younger yeah, yeah. ones. Yeah. You use a lot of TV sometimes because I didn't make yeah. bread from scratch. Yeah. And I'm tired and I'm up and whatever. And you know, it's not the way that they depict it. It's hard as hell, just like it is to be a boss wife or whatever. It's all hard. Uh, so I think they need to communicate it. Oh, so that, I think we're saying the same thing. That's yeah. what I think. I think oh, that I they depict an extreme oh. version of what a traditional wife, because I have a lot of traditional values. And I, and that, Katrina and I watched this together because this is an area in our relationship, especially early on, that was a little more challenging. She grew up in a matriarch. I grew up very traditional. And so if there's something that we ever might do not see eye to eye on is like sometimes like the, the running of a household, because I lean more on this, these traditional views, she's more coming from a matriarch. And so I think that what we're the, we get it wrong is it's depicting the extreme version of that. I believe our house has something very similar. I mean, my, my wife works as crazy or if not more than I work. So she's definitely not a quote unquote traditional yeah. housewife, but there's a lot of those values. I think that uh, are appealing to both her and I, and that we try and organize our house in that manner. That does not mean that there aren't exceptions to the rule where I do a more uh, traditional wife chore around the house and she does a more masculine chore or thing around the house. That's why I mean like 
this is where social media goes so bad is that it's like you you depict the most extreme version here. The people that are debating it are the most extreme version on the other side. And it's like, well, there's a little more room for nuance. And there is something to be said about like, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I find that uh, traditional values are very appealing to me and, and how I like our house to be ran. It doesn't mean that I'm like, my wife can't work, yeah. but you know, she answers to me. It's like, it's not really like, it's not like that. But I think that, but I also think that what's also interesting is that it's getting this much traction, which what that tells me, and I think the biggest takeaway I have is that we overcorrected the other way so extreme that this extreme opposite becomes trendy. And that's what I, I think that we have been telling women for so for the last two or three decades that make your own money, be a boss, but that message has become so overcorrected mm -hmm. and extreme I that we are seeing a lot of a lot of women going like, hey, actually it's not as fulfilling as they sold it to that's us the as. problem i think the problem is men too by the way we get sold this lie. yes too. agreed like we're, we're getting sold that we find fulfillment in things that you don't actually find fulfillment in and i remember when i was a kid i remember my mom introducing herself and people asking her what she did and i remember her uh responding almost apologetically because she knew how people respond she says like oh i'm just uh, you know i'm just a housewife type of deal i'm like just like i know what you do mom right like you do a lot and it was like, and I feel like society, media, whatever, made it so that it was like, oh, that's not a good thing to do. You're you need like to go. frowned upon. Just, yeah. one, just one generation, though, before that, it would be a sense of pride. That's right. That's it right. would be a sense of pride. Not that's right. But look at, look at the flip it did for men. Like, if you're a guy and you're talking to a bunch of dudes, uh, it used to be a sense of pride to say that you were married and you had a lot of kids. Now it's like, oh, right. you, oh, mm -hmm. oh you're married. Oh. You're married, okay. Oh, you got a lot of kids. Oh, your life must be. Oh, yeah. You got to go home, right? You can't really hang out, type of deal. I think we're sold the wrong shit. What fulfills people? A lot of this traditional values is because for thousands of years, we've learned what fulfills us, and what fulfills us is not, you know, making tons of money. Yeah. It's not getting lots of pleasure. It's not sleeping with a lot of people. It's not. It's like finding meaningful relationships, team unit. focusing on your children, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. you know, doing all that stuff. You it know? has to be about respect and it has to be about what's going to actually move your family forward and like benefit everybody. And so it's like, you got to kind of go through the process of figuring that out with your partner of what their strengths are, what your strengths are. And then you, you delegate and you divide and conquer. And it's like, if you're both working at the same thing and it, whatever that looks like, you know, it, it, and a lot of times it does look more traditional and like in terms of the roles, but it, you know, as long as that works, who gives a shit about what the, you know, the media is telling you it should be, or, or, you know, the, the society d determines it this way. Like who gives a shit? Like you have to just figure this out for yourself and your now, own do family. You, do you guys believe that there are innate traits that each sex possesses that makes logical sense that that's the role that they they play or should play in their household and that's when i say that there's individual variants I, okay when yeah. i say that i don't mean that there's not outliers or i mean example you would someone that is all traditional would say that uh you know the wife cooks and cleans around the house i clean the house 99 percent of the yeah. time so i i think that there's still exceptions to the rule and to your point that there's some things that your wife is going to be stronger at your husband's going to be stronger at yeah. but do you think fundamentally that there are uh innate things that a woman possesses that makes her better at some of these traditional things and there's some innate things that men have that make them better yeah, at their traditional I mean, roles obviously it's a fact it's it's that's why it's echoed in every society and it's not because of oppression uh it's because we work together and succeeded um as a species uh, for a long time figuring this out but yeah of course i mean look i love flipping this on its head because people always hate to hear this so women do this whatever I, i'll flip it on its head okay if you have if you're sitting there and you're interviewing 15 nannies to watch your kids okay and half of them are men half of them are women i guarantee you nine out of ten times the people are not going to pick the men yeah why is it because men are well we kind of know inherently oh you know and it's just we know this inside now i know there's male teachers and all i get it but it's just look at the data on the people who are most likely to be one way most likely to be another way okay it's just 
That's just a fact. That's why we tend to fall into those uh, into those roles and why we have for so long. There's always individual variances. Like, I know, but people would argue, Sal, that statistically it's that way because we've had these no. op this oppression for so long that we've, we've been forced into these roles. Therefore, the data is going to support your argument it's that a, you're You know what makes me so mad is we glorify so long, and, and we all do this, right? We glorify the extreme producers the extreme hyper-focused, I don't do anything else but do this one thing, which tends to be a male trait. This is, a this is a fact, okay? Tends to be a male trait. So what it does simultaneously is it disregards all the incredible women that have done things, raising societies, raising children, doing things that are kind of behind the scenes. And so what happens is we think, oh, that person's more important because they developed this company that created this amazing thing, even though probably a t terrible dad, wasn't ever around his kids, mm -hmm. super hyper-focused, also very challenged and you know had his own issues type of deal. But we idolize them uh, versus like the mom over there down the street. My gosh, she raised three kids and super balanced. They went through some big challenges and she was such a bedrock for the family and so loving and caring and just so wonderful, you know. Like, so I think we have the skewed idea of what is what we should glorify and what we shouldn't. I mean, it's insane to me. This is why, so what I found most interesting about this this podcast episode and, and uh, this movement is more about uh, what does it tell us about ourselves and society currently right now? Yeah. That's what I find like, I don't. I, I don't want to get in a debate with someone that like how you should run your house. You should run how your household works for you and yeah, your partner. I don't give right. a shit, right? But I what I think is interesting is that something like this is is continuing to catch momentum. And what I think that says to me is there's a whole bunch of women that are naturally yearning for that that type of living, but has been told for the last decade or so that that's oppressed, that's being oppressed and giving up your life. And so it's so cra terrible. It's so crazy to me. You're oppressed because you're at home caring for your kids and let's say your husband. So instead what you're going to do is you're going to go get a job and care for some other dude yeah. that's not your husband and his kids, apparently. That's a good thing. Yeah. It's crazy to me. Look, here's the truth, okay? The most important job in my family, okay, if I had to list them in terms of most importance is my kids. There's nothing more important than my children. So my wife is directly connected to that. My job is to provide the environment for my wife and kids. That's it. Now I help raise my kids, but, and I love what I do. I love Mind Pump. I love working with you guys, but I could pick a million different jobs and make money and possibly support us. Maybe right. not as well, but support us. Right. I'm not going to pick four other kids. Yeah. Those are my kids. Yeah. I ain't going to go throw them out and go find some other yeah, ones yeah. to take care yeah, of. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's be honest with the value uh, uh, and the priorities that we You also, make. to your point right there, you also can't possibly think of a probably a better person to raise them than your wife. Nobody. And to be spending the most I, nobody's of Nobody's going to love them, them like my wife. Right. Nobody's yeah. going to take care of them. Yeah. Nobody's going to listen to them and hear them and put up with the challenges like my wife. There's a lot of good people out there, but come on. That's just a, that's just a fact most of the time. I know right. there's always you know crazy situations, yeah, but yeah. that's yeah. a fact most of the time. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just thought it was really interesting. Have you seen any of this, Justin? Have you been paying attention to it? No, no. I just, I thought it was like- Katrina had no idea what it was. Yeah, I thought it was like one of those, you, you know, when somebody's just trying to get attention for like being counter-cultural yeah. and like have a moment of like- Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was just like a video series where that one girl was got, like, like she kind of put it out and then it became a thing. I thought it kind of died out. Yeah, no, it's like, it's so massive. There's like a lot of- famous girls online that have been promoting this message and to like Sal's point I mean I agree like they all, I, they all look like 1960 yeah, 50s pinups it, literally that's what they look the I mean I, 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 I agree yeah. I, it's, <laughs> I mean that's that's what they're yeah, doing it's, it's it's over the top but I mean that's that's social media of yeah, course you know what I'm saying the middle is not fake. yeah the middle is not viral enough so you have to be and again my takeaway from this is like this is interesting that this type of thing is so popular and making, and it's Gen Z in particular yeah. that is drawn and interested it's about. And I think because the millennials got put just like what you're, you were raised in that, be, you know, you're a millennial. So you were or like right on the cusp of that, right? So you, you were raised by a woman that was starting to feel guilty for yeah. staying home where the her mom didn't feel that way at all. That was very normal and what everyone mm -hmm. did and probably proud of it. Then all of a sudden the next generation after that, the next two generations after that, it became, Oh, um, I feel kind of ashamed of it or I shouldn't be that proud of it. And then it became like, we celebrated all these boss bitch women. And that was like the you thing. Know what's crazy? And now you're starting to see, and you know, it's crazy. The overcorrection. Yeah, what's crazy now 
song out. was highlighted with multiple partners. And, you know, we went through this whole cycle, I feel like, yep. of options, right? And then it just comes back to I do like think the men one mirrored it, too. Totally. It's, funny, it's funny that we're just talking about the-, the No, like we all got are, are, screwed, man. Every, I mean, everybody got the wrong messaging, uh, the opposite message. Look, I, I, I bet you right now, if you took 100 people who were listening to this right now, were both husband and wife work, and you sat them down, you know what they would say? We both have to work. We can't afford not to. Yeah. This is the position we've put ourselves in with this type of messaging is that now we're in a situation where I couldn't stay home even if I wanted to yeah. because we can't afford it. Well, that's predictable when we send a message that everybody has to produce because nothing else is valuable. It's more valuable to that. Put your kids in daycare. That's that's more valuable for you guys to work. And, and now we're in that situation oftentimes. Yeah, it's, some of that too is our own doing though too. I mean, a lot of it people is. aren't going to like to hear this, but it's like when you think about like we have our standard of living today has, I mean, I've watched it in my own, my own life. Like it was a big deal if you had a TV in your house. There, Name me a house that doesn't have multiple three to yeah. four TVs in every house now, like a microwave was like a luxury thing. Every house comes with that built into, yeah. like the things that we have now decided are a must have or your basic needs for living has continued to raise. So part of it, and I'm not and I'm not saying that things haven't got out of control with the housing market and rent, like absolutely. We live in one of the worst places in, in the country for that. So I trust me, I get it firsthand and understand and also came from very little. So totally get it. <laughs> But we also have raised the bar of our expectations of what is necessary for living. And so it's a rat race that it's like it's exactly we both right, right, we got we got to work we both yeah. got to work if we want to have the the two to three cars and we want to yep. take two vacations and we want to like so yeah so some of it yes is is some bullshit that society's placed on us but some of it is some of the own bullshit we've placed on ourselves too totally hundred percent yeah it was funny I, I heard this uh, comedian kind of brought up. Uh, the fact that like, so now it's like millennials in college, they're trying to sit around like thinking of the latest app idea, right? Yeah. Like to, to solve the most minor inconvenience we have left. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> it's like, what do we have left? You know, like there's nothing really to solve. Yeah. It's like, we got to get back to like, you know, living a, a, a thriving, healthy life. And it's like, people just like, what, what else is there really to, to solve in terms of our inconvenience? Well, here, I got something for you, Justin. Did you know now uh, you can send meat to a friend? I know this is a oh, topic already, that I, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> butcher box. Hold on. Oh, wow. Butcher box. You wow. guys aren't in on this. Oh, butcher box. You, love you that. definitely got to send right me here. to your yeah. friend. Butcher box. <laughs> now you can order one box to test it out, or send a box to a friend. If you can want. that be the ad? Send to, meat to send a friend. Me, send meat to your friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I'm okay, nice wait, sorry. So I'm sorry. I'm trying I, to shoehorn. I, that I, I know. I know. Okay. So let me ask. Uh, the, what is what is the offer? I'm sorry. It was like, do you get to one box? So instead of having to sign up for whatever, you could just try one box see if you like it or you can send it to somebody if you want that's cool it is very cool yeah because i know there's so a lot a of one-time box you could do so you could test it out to see if so this is each person want. has that ability to do that one time that's so, right yeah so choose someone you really love that's right and earlier i was talking about chicken and how meat has changed right. butcher box is committed to providing you with meat pork so beef pork chicken fish yeah. that is far more natural far healthier you just think of salad, and like you could use some kielbasa right now. Some yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, and they knew the reference when I said said me to a that's a that's answer. part of like Don't we still have, have yet to do that. By the way, which we should do that for Butcher Box. I keep forgetting for the when they have their ads is uh, break down what all of our regular boxes look oh, like. Oh yeah, chicken chicken is in my, chicken thighs are on mine every single time. That's a that's a staple. A, in a ours. lot of mine is uh, chicken nuggets. Tri tip and, ri and chicken nuggets. Is I got to bring also. back. So bro. good. Do you know what we did? Yeah. We ate them so much, so much, so much that my wife's like, stop. Stop it. Stop the order. <laughs> uh, Within one box, she goes, order them again. Yeah, we, <laughs> we can't. That's like, we've ingrained yeah, it in Max. It's like them. a state, yeah, that's a staple meal that he gets. And so we, Katrina's always going to have those on hand for sure. Oh, so. it's it, it's the best. Uh, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, so if you go to the butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, and then I, I actually go to the, their main site. Um, and go up to the top. It says gifts, and you can get all kinds of different gifts. You can oh, share. Oh, they have a people. bestseller section too. So you can too? get boxes under hundred dollars. You can get boxes over uh, under two hundred dollars. Steak lovers, various uh, that's you awesome. Know, forms. Wow, they've evolved the website. Idea. 
Yeah, yeah it's very good. Oh, wow. That's yeah, cool. That's good stuff. All yeah, right, speaking of, of, of partners, um, so NASM, so they're, they're the, for trainers, you guys know that they are, they're the premier certification course, national certification for trainers. They have a performance enhancement specialist certification. I never got that. Did you get that? Yeah, I got of that. Of course you did. I have yeah. too. Oh, you both got that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that used to be called SFS, sport sports fitness specialist, oh, and then it eventually oh. was PES. I actually did yeah, both. I, got, I did the PES. Yeah, so I did the SFS, SFS originally, and it's and all then, for athletic training, right? Yeah, to train well, athletes mm -hmm. for performance. Yeah, they highlight like certain areas of imbalance that could lead to injury, especially in athletics and specific sports, and so that was helpful. Uh, for me, I, I I mean, I wish I trained more athletes. That was like my focus and target, but it turned out to be a general public for the most part. But uh, it was it was a great course for kind of like nailing that down. Now, I'm, I'm, I imagine that when it comes to workout programming, you're going to get more of that in this than you would in other certs because you're dealing with athletes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is that the case? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I know traditional certs don't do a whole lot of workout programming. That's got to be one of the questions so what, we get the most. What I got mm -hmm. from it is you get a lot of great uh, general sports performance stuff so you can then go build programs for – for your average athlete, like mm -hmm. you're not going to go out and be ready for an NFL team, no, of to, course. but you absolutely like it armed me with the ability, like, because I trained a lot of kids, young adults that played basketball as a hobby or, mm -hmm. and they wanted some, I want to be a little bit faster. I want to be more mobile. I want to be able to jump like the tools that it takes to, to do that and program. Well, that cert does that really well. So it's 50% off. That's oh, what wow. they're offering right now. Oh, Which, wow. by the way, NASM, I've known them for, I mean, I've, I've been aware of them for more almost three decades now. Through working with them, they do these 50% off deals with us. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. I don't remember certs ever being half off. I know. I wish it was 50% when I was buying them. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. So that's a good you know one. what? Uh, I wonder if uh, 24 Hour and UFC and these gyms that they do what we used to do. So the way it used to work at, at 24 was – you could go buy the cert like you. I'd go buy the cert back then. It was about five, six hundred bucks. You go buy the cert, and then uh, the next, I want to say, two paychecks, or was it the next six? Oh, over the next six months, that's what it was. They would pay you half back, and then the other half back. Oh, so they basically would cover it. They so just wanted to make sure that you stayed you stuck work. around. You stuck around. You that's... didn't use them to basically pay for the cert and be done with it. So it was like, how many NASM certs did you guys have? Was it just the? Let me guess. Oh, I had was a it bunch, the three? Yeah. You did CPT. I mean, if you count SFS and, and PES as two, I count them as one. So it's the same thing. So I just CES, have the three. So yeah. you had CPT. Correct, yep. uh, CBT, uh, CES, CES, and then the correctional SFS. exercise, and then sport one. You mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I had that, and then I had um, nutrition, the NFS, I believe. And then, um, are, are you the most certified out of all of us? Uh, I, I mean, maybe like I, I had, I had quite a few, I had probably like six, seven probably really? total, but mm -hmm. like a lot of uh, workshop stuff. Like I was very much, once I got past all the certification and working for like a commercial gym, like I, I was all into like going to kettlebell workshops, to mace bell workshops, to like a lot of the unconventional stuff. And then, uh, Olympic ring training and like gymnastics oh, wow. training i did all that kind of shit justin probably for sure is more officially certified in because a lot of the ones that uh, i talk about i just took them because my trainers were and so i would take the book or i'd take the course and i'd go through it with them but i never paid to go to get the the cert yeah i don't like oh, incentivize that's a lot of what i did <laughs> yeah yeah to do yeah, it, the, bro, the structure of it that that's what got me on that path because it was like I wanted to squeeze the potential of my paycheck as much as possible. And then we kind of put that in place. And I was like, oh, yeah. I, kept, I told I you about that it. story, right? So when I, so there was a time, um, I'll never forget this. It was like year five, I'm like year five or six into management. And uh, it's so crazy to me that this wasn't something they taught every manager right away. But we were at uh, Mountain View at one of like the headquarter meetings for all the fitness mm -hmm. managers. And they pull up this stat and it was, a trainer with one national cert, trainer with two national certs, trainer with three national certs, and a master trainer, which means you have to have three national certs plus 5,000 hours. And it showed their longevity in the, the company. Mm -hmm. It showed the total hours they service in a month, and it shows the total revenue that they produce. And of course, it was all connected. Oh, it was crazy, the difference. And literally, I came back to the club, and the next day implemented what Justin's alluding to that I never got permission for because I knew I wouldn't be able to do it. And remember, you know, remember fit hours, right? Yeah, so, yeah. so every manager was, had a budget of total fit hours that you would distribute to your trainers, which allowed you or which allowed them to walk the floor, book free assessments. Wait, so let me guess. You told them you would pay them to study and learn? Yes. Yes. 
without and they, and they didn't know. That. Oh, I did not. That was so I illegal. did not approve it at but all. But great, uh, yeah, because what it, every so this but was great. so illegal. So then what I did yeah. was I used my two top trainers that were already masters, already had a bunch of national certs. Mm-hmm. I had them lead every Friday. Yeah. Group classes with all of my brilliant, trainers in, brilliant. taking them through yeah. certification after certification, where they would study together, get paid to study, and then it would move them up a pay level. So all of them were brilliant. all bought in, that's and that's fun. also how I got to a point within I don't know how many months it was, but we at one point had all master trainers, and I didn't know a, a single facility that had all yeah. master trainers. We had all master trainers at that time and we crushed. So Dude, I carried that title way too long. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were I, I, everywhere I went, I'm like a master trainer. Yeah. It's because I like it. It was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It, was a, it was brilliant on their part it's to like, do that. But yeah, anything. I never got approved to do that. And I know I would have got denied to do that because you weren't allowed to use those hours like that. Um, but when I saw the stats and I was like, if I could just get all these guys up to that and girls up to that level, it's and I tell you what, it was the after that, Oh, I'm sure they crushed. Was the easiest time ever in management I ever had in my life. Just because everybody killed it, everybody did really well, everybody was educated. Like, yeah, and I wish I would have learned that. Someone would have told me that years before. That's all. All I yeah. ever had was the original 24 Fitness cert. I did a CPT from NASM. I got the correctional exercise one. I never. I don't think I ever took the test. I'm not sure. I think I just learned it. Yeah. And I had ISSA, and that was it. After that, it was basically yeah. trainers that worked in my studio. I would learn from them, borrow their books, and watch them. Yeah, That's I did how I learned. CSCS with the guy most too, of the stuff. But yeah, yeah, good deal. Do we have a shout out? Uh, you know what? I, I'll shout out because the last time, and I was listing all the free stuff, Doug failed us and forgot to remind me of the, <laughs> put blame it on Doug, like I do that. Uh, the newsletter also. Oh. So we also have mm. the newsletter, which, and the why I've reminded that, I've actually had a couple, my mom, uh, my client, Christine, and then somebody else have all messaged me in the last month. So shout out to Darren also, because Darren is the writer uh, who we hired to do that. He's been doing it for a while now. And the, it's continued to evolve, right? As far as like, I think providing more value, some entertainment and humor. And so uh, that newsletter um, is incredible. It's free. And so um, if you guys aren't subscribed to that, subscribe to the newsletter. I know we have a landing page, Doug. Yeah, mindpumpmedia.com forward slash newsletter. Cool. Seeds Daily Symbiotic is the world's best probiotic. So what does it do for you? Well, it helps with bloating, helps with healthy regularity. It also helps support your gut barrier, skin health, heart health, and micronutrient synthesis. It's good stuff. If you like probiotics, Seed blows the other ones away. It's the best one there is. Go check them out. Get yourself a discount. Go to seed.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code 25 mind pump. Get 25% off. All right, back to the show. First question is from Kara Zoller, CNS. Does it matter how high up your back leg is when you're doing Bulgarian split squats? The bench seems too high, so I use a step with two risers under each side. Yeah. Yeah, I did a video on matter. this on YouTube. Um <clears throat> A long time ago, and I'm on Mind Pump TV about getting set up for a, a Bulgarian split squat. You know, one of the most common things is the feeling it pulling and stretching your your hip flexor, mm-hmm. and yeah. not actually feeling it in the lead leg. They feel it in the trail leg because yeah. they're in such a stretched position. So that's why this matters. Yeah, so. you shouldn't feel a big stretch in that back leg. No, uh, your your knee should be able to bend in the back leg. You should feel most of the pressure on the front leg. There is some variance on how on the height and and. and for an individual based off of that. So some people could do a little higher, a little lower. There's no standard, I would say, Bulgarian split stance squat height. Nonetheless, if your back leg feels like it's stretching or you feel like you're helping yourself with that back leg, then it may be too high. And if your knee hits the floor, uh, then it's probably too low. And if your back knee is bending really, really strongly where it's almost bumping into the front leg, then you're too close. That's another issue. Sometimes people get too close yeah. to the bench. Some people have back. issue too with, um, you know, going on their tippy toes yeah. versus on flat footed. And, and really that's like a preference thing for me for the most part. One cool product, and I know you guys have probably seen this out there, and that you can uh, attach to your squat rack. Now it's like a pad yep. that, that you can you can set it at the right height, so you can really just form your foot over the but, top of it, and it's super comfortable. By the way, this is a great use of um, a squat pad, in my opinion, the squat bar pad. Oh yeah! If you take a barbell and you set it at the right height, you can use that to put your foot on. It's your makeshift yeah. Smith version. machine 
that. too. Yeah. And yeah. now you've got a reason to use uh, a squat pad because they definitely are. <laughs> I mean, another reason to use a Smith machine. I mean, yeah. there, you, there you go right there. Like for, for this listener, like whether you have a home gym and you have your own rack investing in the piece that Justin's talking about because it's relatively inexpensive through a company like PRX, you can get that. If you don't have if you don't have your own home gym and it's not something you want to buy, then your makeshift version of it is what you just said, yep. Sal, which is basically setting the barbell up on a squat rack and then putting the the, the pad on there at wherever you need it. I and you'll see if you watch on Mind Pump TV, I did this video. I like to set up from the ground up versus what a lot of people do is they like hook their leg and they hop around in the position. I actually start at the bottom position and that's how I decide where my f my front foot is going oh. to be and where my trail is. So you'll see in the video, I break it down on how to do it. That's how I teach it. Next question is from Valdez Lucian nine. If I miss a few days of maps 15, can I do a few workouts all in one day? Yeah, you definitely can. Now the program, like all of our programs is laid out in an ideal way, meaning mm -hmm. If you follow it as it's laid out, that's the best way to follow it for the most part. There's always individual variances, but for the most part. So for people who know what MAPS 15 is, this is a program that essentially you're working out five or six days a week and your workouts last between 15 to 20 minutes, depending on what version you do. The The 15 minute version uses a suspension trainer. The 20 minute version uses barbells and it's essentially two exercises a day. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing two 45 to 60 minute workouts a week, you're doing one 15 to 20 minute workout most days. Um, and it's about two exercises. So that's essentially what it looks like. So the question is, well, if I miss three days, then can I do six exercises in a day instead of two because I skipped you know, three days or two days? Well, yeah. Yeah. In fact, we designed it that way. Mm -hmm. We designed it so that you could, in fact, do that Stack if you needed to. Yeah. But following, a, doing a little bit every day is what makes Math 15 so special for many different reasons. One of them is the consistency. It's very easy on the body. The recovery is The recovery amazing. is great. It equates to a good amount of total volume, but because it's done daily, it helps build better habits. Um, and people, it's got to be one of our most pop. It is definitely one of our most popular programs. I tend to just pick up where I left off, uh, especially if it's a week or less. Once I start getting to two weeks and beyond of time off, well, then that that changes. Like normally, I'll really start over mm -hmm. on a program um, or start over completely in a week. But if let's say you're on say day three of Maps 15 and you miss three days, I would just pick up on day four, right? And go right mm. back to that. So just skip them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just go right back to it. Um, typically that's how I do it, especially since that's kind of like an upper lower split the entire, entire way. That way I just pick right back up where I was going and you'd be fine. It's not like, uh, there's something magical about those exact days, uh, together and like having to try and smush them all together just so you could stay on course. I just pick it right back up. Hey, real quick. Sorry to interrupt you. Look, we have a sale this month on some programs. We have a beginner program. Map Starter. It's 50% off. Then we have a bundle that's different. It's called the Starter Bundle that includes our most popular programs. That's also 50% off. So if you're interested in that, just click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Next question is from Seed Leadens Coaching. What are the best exercises to lift breasts after years of breastfeeding? Okay, so first off, there's not a ton you can do through exercise uh, for this, okay? There's a little bit you could do and the reason why I'm saying a little bit is because you'll get somewhat of an effect, but don't get your hopes up. A lot of it's, it's not genetics. A, big hmm? a lot of it's genetics. It is. Uh, but let's just say, okay, you're dealing with what you're dealing with. Is there anything I can do? You can train your upper chest. Yep. That can definitely help. And I've had female clients comment on this, but that, that would require you to develop, you know, good muscular turn the upper chest, which is a hard area to develop anyway. And it's limited, right? It's yeah. not like really lifting your, your your breasts up, but it can help. The other thing you can do is stay well hydrated and make sure you eat adequate protein because protein is what keeps the skin healthy and strong. So so strength training, by the way, has that uh, effect as well. But there's not a ton. Yeah, so not I don't, a lot. Don't I, expect like these results like you're going to get from I mean, the plastic surgeon. Reinfor reinforcing like, uh, you know, that, that shoulder back position and like better upright posture, you know. I mean, in, in terms of like just training – um, you know, the rhomboids and, and making sure to the, um, you know, your upper back, uh, is nice and strong and brace. That's, that's really it besides you're saying the upper chest, but I mean, that's, that's just kind of the basics. I think for somebody who lifts consistently, you see minimal, but somebody who doesn't ever lift and then getting someone to do upper chest makes a big difference. Just like somebody who has kind of a saggy butt and then they've never squatted before and you get them to squat, it makes a big difference. Yeah, but the, the glutes are muscle. 
Uh, there's fat there too. But yeah, but there's. Like, I mean, there's. What are you talking about? The upper chest is muscle. It so. is, but it, but so much of the breast is is fatty. Yeah, yeah, but I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not going to take someone who's sagging all the way down here sitting up at the top of their chest, but it, it, it's enough of a difference that you'll, you'll you notice. will notice the difference, especially someone who doesn't lift already. If you're somebody who already consistently lift, you're already done what you can you, do. You've done already quite yeah. a bit, so you you won't see as big of a difference. But someone who doesn't, and then you go and you train upper chest, like you know, incline bench. By, by the way, the muscles do play a role. There was a study I talked about years ago that showed that wearing a bra contributes to to boobs sagging more because atrophy, right? of the support yeah. of the breasts and the muscles that tend to hold them up, or some of the muscles that hold them up atrophy because of support. So actually, not wearing a bra, which they used to think the opposite, right? If you don't wear a bra, you'll get saggy boobs. No, wearing a bra actually contributes more, uh, based on the study that I read. Next question is from Kony Chua. Can I exchange trigger sessions for so focus or mobility sessions while running MAPS Anabolic and see similar results? You'll see different results. That's why they're different, right? Uh, <laughs> focus sessions are more focused on a specific body part, whereas trigger sessions tend to be more general for the whole body. And the mobility sessions, just like the name implied, yeah. uh, implies, is for improved mobility. Um, so you will see, you're not going to see the same results from all three of them because they're all totally different. I like this, though. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why I like this is because in my experience of training people, I have yet to meet any clients that do not greatly benefit from mobility drills. And it seems that everybody has got some sort of dis dysfunction or lack of ankle mobility or hip mobility or shoulder mobility. And so, and that and it seems to be present all the time and mm -hmm. forever. Right. And so I find using mobility sessions in replace of trigger and, and, and focus sessions tends to be a, a better general advice for the average person who's just trying to be healthy. Now, to your point, Sal, uh, if you're a bodybuilder and you're trying to use focus sessions to bring up a lagging body part, uh, mobility is not going to do this nowhere near no, the same thing no. as focus. If you are a, you know, MAPS anabolic, you're trying to build maximal amount of muscle in that period of time, uh, not doing trigger sessions is not going to get that the most. But generally speaking, those programs are, are well designed enough that you're going to build good muscle, build a good body on just following the foundational days. And then if you took the off days or the trigger days or the focus days and did mobility, the general person would, would greatly benefit I, from I that agree kind of structure. I agree 100%. I can't think of a single person that wouldn't gain benefit from mobility sessions over trigger or focus sessions. Right. I, if trigger and focus sessions are more about uh, aesthetic development. Mm -hmm. Mobility session is about movement and everybody can move better, which by the way, I want to be very clear. Moving better also contributes to aesthetics because yeah. you could perform exercises more effectively. All those big exercises that you do on those foundational workouts, they're just not as easy to sell because I can sell easily to somebody, hey, do you want to develop your butt more? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You uh, then I can say, hey, do you yeah. want to have better hip mobility? Like, doesn't sound like, I don't want to, you know, nobody's going to stop me at the beach and say, hey, nice hip mobility. Uh, they're going to say nice, <laughs> nice glutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Justin yeah. might. A good I mean, the, the truth is I actually, really like I use for a lot of family and friends and myself uh, anabolic in this manner. Uh, oh, I, I do more mobility sessions for people too. Yeah. yeah. So I typically you know, tell them, hey, follow the foundational days. And then those two mobility exercises I taught you, do those on your trigger days. That's a lot of, like, I mm -hmm. tend to prescribe that to family and friends well, most of the time. It's a good way to, to extend. And this is something that we, we kind of bring up that you kind of have to break it up. You have to do other like lateral movement, twisting movements, things like that to incorporate. And if you incorporate the mobility sessions within, you know, those like real solid muscle building type programs, like your anabolics and strong and, and all these other types of programs, you can gain the benefit of also then That's stimulating right. and, and reinforcing your, your joints along the process. So, I mean, it is beneficial in that regard. I think most of these are like run the program, how we have it laid out. Cause the intention of it is to get that type of adaptation, come back to it, you know, add a new spice by adding one of these other types of, uh, uh, frequency builder. And this is why I picked this question was because I, we haven't, we haven't talked about this in quite a while. Um, you know, when we designed the programs, that was the thought process. Exactly what Justin said is like, ideally the, the client follows them exactly how they're laid out. And if, you know, you can go through all of them, then you now can go like, okay, I've, I find that man, when I felt the best, 
in performance, mainly because of all that mobility work I was doing. Okay, well, but then I, man, I saw the most gains in anabolic. A lot of people love the way they feel in anabolic, and it's, it's seen why it's one of the state, the uh, flagship programs. And so, oh, I love the gains I got from that. Okay, there's a way to kind of marry those, to, like to Justin's point of like, hey, now you can run anabolic, it, reap a lot of the benefits that you say you got from that, but then also address some of the mobility stuff that you recognize that you got from performance, and then you kind of get a blend of both. Uh, that's kind of how I, I like people to start to use the programs as you've got after you've gone through all of them. But ideally, you follow it as it's laid out at least once, so you understand what the adaptation, the what we are trying to accomplish with writing it that way. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out: thirty percent body fat for men. This is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from thirty to ten. What is ten percent body fat? This is when you have a visible. Six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body